Good morning. It's good to see everybody here this morning in Sunday school class. Thank you for being out with us this morning. We'll go ahead and take up a prayer request. Anyone have a request you want the class to pray about? Just let it be known anywhere. Yes. Can you pray for Brother Cleve's niece, others? Yes. Can you hold them up in prayer? Yes, Charlie, yes. <coughs> Others? Unspoken request, just lift your hand. Let's remember all these. Let's remember service today. Of course, we all have lost loved ones. Just hold them up in prayer. Let's all pray together. Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you, God, for another wonderful day that you've given us to come to your house. We thank you, God, for the opportunity, Lord, to assemble together, Lord, and, and to worship in spirit and truth. And Father, we just pray, God, that you touch and minister, Lord, to these requests that's been shared here today. God, we continue to hold up our brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord, that are uh, struggling. We pray, God, that you would strengthen them. We pray for healing for those, God, that are sick in body. And Father, we pray, Lord, for each unspoken request. I just ask, God, that you administer to each need there. And Father, be with our, our lost loved ones, God. We pray for them, God. We pray for salvation, Lord. We pray for revival for, for our church, Lord, for our community. God, we just pray that you just move and minister to each and every need here this morning. We pray, God, that you just help us, Lord, to come together, Lord, to worship you in spirit and truth. Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right. The title of our lesson today is Testifying to the Gospel. Continuing our study uh, about Apostle Paul and his missionary journeys, uh, and then what takes place after that. The central truth today is it is not only the church's responsibility, but every Christian's responsibility to testify about Christ to the lost. So our introduction in today's lesson is that at Caesarea, a prophet named Agabus came to see Paul and foretold Paul's arrest and imprisonment. Hearing this, all Paul's friends, including Luke, the author of the book of Acts, tried to convince Paul that, Paul that he should not go to Jerusalem. However, Paul expressed his determination to go up to Jerusalem. Some of the Caesarean Christians insisted on accompanying Paul to the capital city. Paul's arrival in Jerusalem was the occasion for a joyful reunion. Paul presented to the church the offering collected from the churches on his third missionary journey, the next day an official meeting of all the leaders of the church at Jerusalem, including James, its pastor at that time, was convened, and Paul told them about all the wonderful things God had been doing among the Gentiles. So he, he'd given his report here about his missionary journeys to the, to the mother church. And when Paul had finished reporting to the leaders at Jerusalem, they turned around and they told Paul about, you know, growth in Jerusalem and the surrounding area as well. You know, things were going, you know, the spirit was moving. There was revival everywhere, uh, but there was an issue. <coughs> so, we're, you know, there's always going to be problems, aren't they? You know, especially when things seem to be going well. And this problem was that uh, Jewish Christians, Jewish converts were still holding on to uh, Jewish traditions and customs. Now, there was yeah, kind of differentiate here a little bit. There, there were those that that just held on to these customs because it was a way of life for them, you know, and, and it's a consecrated life, uh, things they did. But then there were also those that imposed these traditions and the law upon, upon Christians and actually added to the uh, to their salvation you know these things had to had to be observed you know to be saved so was there was a kind of a mixed group there a mixed message you know and we all know that Paul you know and, and the early church dealt with this you know throughout the, the years there and and so what was concerning to the leaders here at <coughs> at the church at Jerusalem was that People had already come to Jerusalem. This was Pentecost. It was a feast. So there's people from all over the world, Jews from all over the world coming back to celebrate. 
and some of them we'll see, some of them that Paul had already encountered had come, and they'd already told uh, um, uh, the, the believers there that Paul was, uh, was teaching against the law of Moses and actually telling Jews that, you know, you don't need to observe the law of Moses, you don't need to be circumcised, and things that actually he wasn't saying, but they, they you know, they were telling these things about him. And uh, so we know this, as we look get into the lesson, we'll see that develops into a problem. But the, the, the focus of the lesson today is, uh, is on Paul's personal testimony as we get into it. His, his personal experience, you know, uh, with salvation, his relationship with God, his personal relationship with God. And so the question arises to all of us, what's your testimony? You know, what's your testimony? Uh, you know, what what is your experience with God? How you got saved and 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 how you live after you're saved. <coughs> and the reason we ask that question is because that's your witness and that's what you know, that's what's going to allow people to look to you and and say What's different? You know, what? Why is? Why are you different? And that's your answer. Your that's your testimony. Your testimony. And I got to thinking about that. What's you know? What's my testimony? Y'all have heard me say that I had a drug problem when I was growing up, and that problem was I was drugged to church three times a week. You know, I mean, we've all know that. We've heard that, and uh, uh, and probably all of us, ex most of us, experience the same thing as well. And during that time of growing up, I never accepted <coughs> Christ as my Savior. Never went to the altar, even though I had plenty of opportunities. Had plenty, you know, this was a separate Baptist church, so every revival, you know, you had people coming back, you know, and tugging on you and pulling you. And <coughs> so I had opportunity, didn't take it. Got away from home, immature, young, outside of the protection of home life and and things got a little crazy and got a little wild. Then settle down, get married. Thank you, Cindy. <laughs> and uh, so we come to Russell County. <coughs> Thank you, Sister Parthena, because uh, that was our connection to this church. And and one Sunday morning, we both went to the altar and got saved. After that, you live every day for God. You know, you take the good, you take the bad, and when you look back, you say, I wouldn't trade a thing. I wouldn't trade a thing. Uh, and so, you know, and, and this is something that, <coughs> and we all have different testimonies, right? And when we, when we give those testimonies, when we talk about that uh, to people that are lost, they, that's what they want to hear. You know, uh, they want to hear how, how to, you know, what, how did it affect you? What is your, you know, what do you say about it, right? So as we get into the lesson today, you know, we're going to talk about <coughs> Paul's testimony. We're going to talk about the uproar in the temple. But at any time, if, if anybody wants to give their testimony, the floor is open uh, to do just that. And if you need to holler at me or throw something at me to stop me to do that, if you feel uh, you want to give your testimony, you know, I think today would be a good day to do that. And if nothing else, it's good practice, right, for when you talk to someone that's lost, you know, and that's your testimony. And that's the example Paul gives us here, you know. So it, we'll go ahead and get into our lesson, but like I say, if anybody wants to jump up and, and give their testimony, that's just fine. So <coughs> it says, from 26 through 30, Paul had a drug problem too, didn't he? Paul was dragged from the temple, right? He was dragged out. So then Paul took the men and the next day purifying himself with him entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help. This is the man that teaches all men everywhere against the people and the law in this place, the temple, and further brought Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. 
for they had seen him before with him in the city of Trophimus and Ephesians, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And all the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were shut. So the... (coughs) So Paul had ended up his, he ended his third missionary journey, he come back to Jerusalem uh, against the advice of his friends, of course, uh, but he, he knew, you know, God had revealed to him this was his, this was his destiny, this was what he was, you know, was going to do. And, uh, and so the church council, <coughs> after they warned Paul about these rumors that were going on, on about him, they recommended that Paul uh, give uh, Jewish Christians a sign of loyalty, you know, to their traditions. And what was that sign? There was, uh, commentaries tells us there's four men that were uh, uh, finishing up their vow of the Nazarite where they, it's a, a vow where you consecrate yourself to the gods by uh, not partaking of wine. I think from numbers it kind of goes through the steps of what that vow is, not cutting your hair, uh, but it's just a, 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 a time of consecration. And they were finishing that up. And at the end of that vow of the Nazarite, <coughs> they would go to the temple as a, as a cleansing process and then a sacrifice that they would make. And this was kind of expensive. So a lot of times people would sponsor them. So, so they recommend for Paul here, why don't you sponsor these four and then go with them you know, for this cleansing process. Uh, so Paul agrees to do that. And, you know, we go back to Paul, you know, he always knew his audience, right? We've talked about that before. He knew who he was talking to. And so he knows, you know, this is something that, you know, that may uh, the, the Jewish Christians could look at and, and maybe get a different perspective of Paul, you know. And so so he does, you know, he, he, he agrees to that. And... Um, he does that because of all the rumors that was going around, right? If you look at verse 21 again, what were they saying? <clears throat> they are informed of thee that thou teachest to all the Jews, which are among the Gentiles, to forsake Moses' law. He never, he never told the Jews to forsake Moses' law. You know, what he did tell them was that, you know, Jesus was, you know, the fulfillment of that law, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children. He never told them that, neither to walk after the customs. And he never brought a Gentile into the temple, even though they said that he did. So he was accused of things that, that you know, he didn't do. And um, so, so he, he goes and enters into the temple with, uh, with these four to finish up their vow. And, uh, and now, you know, maybe they can see uh, Paul as a person who was, you know, who was not doing the things that they had accused him of doing, and uh, you know, saying, "I, you know, and you know, I'm in the temple. You know, I'm going through this cleansing process." And uh, if you notice, uh, <coughs> verse 27 here it says, "Now, when the seven days were almost ended, that cleansing process, notice the Jews from Asia." <coughs> This is where Paul had established churches, right? We talked about that. And this is where uh, they would rise up against Paul and, you know, and and, uh, run him out of the town because, you know, they were, uh, their their idle business was was going down and all these things. Uh, But uh, let's see, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and, and laid hands on him. So, Again, some of the same ones that threatened to stone him, you know, and, and, and do other things. They stirred up the locals with this false narrative, you know, rumors, right, tales. Uh, rumors can be very hurtful, be very destructive, can't they? Uh, when you get back to the source of the rumor, it's usually totally different than, than what you have over here, right? We've all played a little game where you whisper a sentence to somebody and you go down the line what happens when you get to the end it's nothing like what you start out and uh, gossip kind of the same way in the rumors so uh, 
consider that when you hear gossip you consider you consider that when you hear rumors as well so so they have accused Paul you know again of all these things he didn't do uh, and and actually uh, bringing a Gentile into the temple and uh, you know he would be put to death for that so um, <clears throat> it says a missionary in India asked one of his converts whether he was willing to go to a neighboring tribe to tell them of Christ's love. The man was earning 12 rup rupees a month instead of the 12 he would receive but four. said, can you go for four rupees? The new believer thought and prayed. Then he came back and he said, I can't go for four rupees a month, but I can't go for Jesus. And, he, and for Jesus he went. He was willing to suffer for Christ's name. In other words, take, you know, less. That was true service, the, the service of suffering. And that's kind of, you know, a reflection of Paul's ministry, wasn't it? Uh, so, and as Paul was to be led, wait a minute, jumped one, didn't I? Sorry, here we go, 31 through 36. Uh, so the crowd drug him out of the temple, and as they went about to kill him, Tidings came unto the chief captain of the band that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. Who immediately took soldiers, centurions, and ran down unto them. And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they, they left beating with Paul. And then the chief captain came near and, and took him, commanded him to be bound with two chains, and demanded who he was and what he had done. Some cried one thing, some another, among the multitude. And when he could not know the certainty of the tumult, he commanded them, him to be carried into the castle. And when he came up on the stairs, so it was, he was born of the soldiers for the violence of the people. For the multitude of the people followed after, crying away with him. So the crowd, you know, had drugged Paul out of the temple, and they were intent on killing him. As they went about to kill him, right? I mean, very simply, you know, the mob was going to kill Paul. Uh, they had blood in their eyes, and there was a... <coughs> Uh, a uh, garrison, I guess, a Roman garrison close to the temple, and when they heard the uproar and the chief captain was notified, says soldiers and centurions ran down. Uh, if you notice centurions, plural, that's at least two. A centurion usually commands, what, 100 soldiers, so there's at least, what, 200 soldiers. So it's a big crowd, you know, and they were, they were intent on killing Paul, but uh, this... Uh, so the soldiers come in, they, <laughs> when, when the crowd sees them, they calm down, and then the captain tries to figure out what's going on. He um, puts Paul in chains and, and asks questions and can't get a clear answer because, you know, we've talked about this before, it's mob mentality that, that sometimes takes hold of people. And, and, and what happens is uh, people join in, they don't even know why they're joining in, some of them, you know. And so they ask, well, what, what, you know, what, what has Paul done? Well, some said one thing, some said another, some did, probably didn't even know what. They just, you know, they just saw the crowd, and here they come. Uh, so, so there's all kinds of different answers, and the captain uh, says, let's take him into the, into the garrison. You know, we don't, uh, uh, we don't know, you know, we need to figure this out. And as they go, the crowd gets more emboldened, even though these are Roman soldiers, and, and uh, they start screaming, you know, away with him, away with him, and they have to carry Paul in uh, because of, I guess, the beating that he, that he took. And so, uh, so once again, Paul finds himself in a pretty bad situation, you know, and... Uh, and once again, we see God's hand on Paul, don't we? Because uh, uh, these Roman soldiers come to his rescue. Um, and the crowd, again, you know, they were, they were so enraged at Paul, but really didn't have a real reason to be enraged. And so <coughs> it reminds, reminds us of what? Of another event that took place so many years earlier when you know, the crowd said, crucify him, crucify him, give us Barabbas. You know, it's just that, that mob mentality, you know, that uh, it, it just shows us how, you know, people can be swayed, especially when there's a lot of emotions 
involved and uh, you know I can't help but think you know with social media and all the things that we're exposed to today and we have to be careful about what we're listening to don't we? We have to be very careful about you know what's the source of this you know because if we're not careful we'll be attached to the wrong to the wrong thing and uh, and find up find ourselves on the wrong side of a of a wrong cause. Any comments here before we go on? Okay. There we go. <coughs> and as Paul was to be led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee, who said, Canst thou speak Greek? And art not thou that Egyptian which before these days made us an uproar and led us out into the wilderness, 4,000 men that were murderers or assassins? And, but Paul said, I am a man which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean country, and I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. And when he had given him a license to do so, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with the hand unto the people. And when there was made a great silence, he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue, saying, Men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make now unto you. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence. And he said, I am verily a man which am a Jew born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up to this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers and was zealous toward God as ye all are this day. And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prison both men and women, as also the high priest doth bear me witness and all the estate of the elders for whom also I received letters unto the brethren and went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound unto Jerusalem to be punished. So this is Paul's testimony. You know, this is, this is him, you know, and he asked the captain uh, to speak to the mob that was trying to kill him. And, uh, and of course, the captain is surprised when he speaks in Greek. He sees that Paul's, you know, maybe a, a more educated man than he first thought. Uh, and he thought he might be a criminal, uh, an Egyptian, you know, that, uh, that took some assassins and tried to overthrow the Roman government. And Paul assures him, I'm not that man, I'm, you know, I'm who I am. So the captain agrees to let Paul speak to the, to the, to the mob, to the crowd, and he does so. And as he starts, <coughs> he, he speaks in Hebrew, in the Hebrew tongue. So wait a minute. So now the crowd kind of has, you know, he has their attention because, you know, Hebrew is not a language that, you know, if you speak Hebrew, you're, you're probably a Jew, you know, you're, you know, so, uh, so, so that gets their attention, and when the crowd quiets down, uh, you know, it's kind of like, well, maybe he is one of us. Let's, let's listen to what he has to say, and, um, and, and he does. He starts uh, talking about himself, and he identifies himself as, you know, as a Jew of Tarsus, you know, and he tells them, you know, where he was born, where he was raised where he was educated, he'd come to Jerusalem. He, he was taught by Gamaliel, you know, and Gamaliel, of course, had a great reputation there as well, uh, being a great teacher. And here is Paul being educated by, by someone like Gamaliel. So, so he's, you know, when he addresses the crowd as men, brethren, and friends, he's being very honest, you know. You know, he's not putting on a show here. He's actually, he actually is a brethren. Uh, and, and they understand that when he starts, you know, telling them about his background. So here's his testimony, right? So he's starting to identify. And so that's why, you know, we started out talking about our testimony, you know, the importance of it. And uh, so, so, you know, and, and he goes on. He says, you know, I, I understand your rage because I was just like you were, B.C. before Christ. What do you mean? Well, <coughs> Uh, I was zealous toward God, even though uh, the zealous attitude I had was wrong. But he said, just like you, uh, I was zealous toward God as ye are this day. Because, 
you may not know it, but I persecuted all those that were in the way. And we talk about, you know, when, when you hear see that term, the way, you know, that's, that's, the Christian, that's the Christian lifestyle. And Paul's very honest, you know, when he says, you know, I, I was just like you. I, I persecuted uh, Christians. I attacked them. Uh, and by myself, I, I took the initiative and to hunt them down, to imprison them. And, of course, when they were in prison, some of them were probably put to death. So that was at Paul's own hand. And, and you know, you read uh, uh, Paul's letters, you know, and, and he, he's well aware of that, of what he's done, you know. And, uh, you know, he's, uh, he knows, you know, that he, at, at this time, he, you know, he did some things that were very terrible, very wrong. And uh, I did all these things, though, thinking that I was the right hand of God, thinking that I was doing what God had called me to do. You know, so, again, zealous, just like you. And, uh, uh, you know, you can even check the records in the temple because I had letters or orders or warrants of arrest to go to Damascus and to bring back. Uh, those that were Christians, you know, that were imprisoned and put them in prison. And uh, so, yes, I feel, I felt, past tense, exactly what you feel today, this crowd, right? Uh, the hatred, uh, you know, the, the stirring. And again, he says, I, you know, I identify with you. Uh, I was just like you thinking I was doing the right thing. And... Uh, convinced that my religion would save me. So no doubt here he had the full attention of who he was talking to, right? Uh, because, you know, he, he identifies with them. And, and any comments here? <coughs> Your witness. My witness, non-Christians first need to detect the reality of genuine Christian experience in our lives. Then they will be attracted by our words about Jesus Christ and what it means to know him personally. Your witness, my witness. So what else about Paul's witness? And it came to pass, he went on and said, I made my journey and was come nigh to Damascus about noon. We all know this, don't we? Suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me and I fell under the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And they that were with me saw indeed the light. They were afraid, but they, they, they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. They could hear a noise, but they couldn't hear the words, what was being said. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there it shall be told of, of all things which are appointed for thee to do. And when I could not see for the glory of that light being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came into Damascus, and one Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, notice, having a good report uh, of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked up upon him Paul's testimony right what you know how how was he converted what what changed you know Paul was you know Paul had already was telling the crowd this is how I was so now what changed uh, now you're different so he tells them about his Damascus Road encounter with Jesus every detail the reality of it you know the way he talked about it it was very real and uh, the, the, the bright light, the voice of, of Jesus and all, all that took place there and actually, you know, the words, what he said, you know, identified, you know, this is Jesus. I am Jesus, the, the one that you persecuted. So of course, Paul question is what, what would you have me to do, right? What would you have me to do? And this is Paul honestly telling his audience here, this is, this is how it happened to me. And he goes on and tells about his experience about being taken to Damascus, being led there, and, and, and being uh, in the audience of Ananias, a devout Jew, good reputation, good report among all the Jews uh, which dwelt there. 
and and he came and he stood upon you know next to me and and prayed for me and that I would receive my sight um, so think about that question that Paul asked you know right at the first there what would you have me to do and you know we've talked about Paul's missionary journeys and uh, the one thing that you know that everything that Paul did right it was under the leadership guidance of God the Holy Spirit would you know he would seek God's will and he started out you know one of the first questions he asked right what would you have me to do uh, so so Paul continued that practice right of, of, of asking God you know seeking God's will and uh, you know what is your will for me today God uh, what would you have me to do um, so Paul's conversion, as he describes it here, as we read about it in the book of Acts, we know it's very dramatic. You know, the bright lights, the, the voice of Jesus talking to him. But every person, every person's conversion is different. You know, mine was on a Sunday morning uh, in a church service. Some of y'all different, I'm sure, uh, of how, how it happened. But, uh, but each just as important to us, right? Um, and, and because every conversion is life-changing. Paul talked about how he was before, how he is now. Same with you and me. How was we before, and how are we now? Everything perfect? No. Is it supposed to be? No, afraid not. But everything's good. We can all say that, can't we? And so... Um, that conversion that we talk about, Paul wrote about it in the book of Corinthians. He said, therefore, if any man be in Christ, you know, when you're saved, right, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And we can read this scripture every day, and it would be true, right? Every day we get up as a child of God, we're a new creature. Old things passed away. All things become new. Any comments here? So far, so good, Paul. Your testimony. You know, you talked about <coughs> how you was before Christ. and Now you talked about your conversion. So uh, let's keep going. And Paul did. He said, the God of our fathers have chosen thee. That thou shouldest know his will. This is Ananias still talking to Paul. And see that that just one shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. For thou, Paul, shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And now why tarriest, tarriest thou? Arise, be baptized, wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple. Notice he was praying in the temple. I was in a trance. Saw a vision and saw him saying unto me, Make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive the testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord, they know that I am prisoned and beat in every synagogue, them that believed on thee. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. And he said unto me, the Lord said, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Uh-oh. And they gave him audience unto this word, and then lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. So Paul continued his testimony. And, of course, Ananias had, uh, had told, revealed to Paul some things that, that God had told him. Uh, and instructed him uh, on, on what was going to take place and what he needed to do. Uh, and so, uh, Paul, you are to share your testimony. What did he, he say? He said, um, Thou shalt be a witness unto all the men of what thou hast seen and heard. So it's a very simple message. Paul, you're to share your testimony wherever you go. And that's the message that each one of us 
also have it, right? Share your testimony. Wherever you go, whoever you come into contact with, share what Jesus has done for you. And tell the people what you've seen, what you've heard. And, and so Paul goes to Jerusalem, and he's praying in the temple. And once again, Jesus appears to Paul uh, with instructions. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and Paul reminds, you know, his audience here, you know, you know, I was there in Jerusalem, and they, they were well aware of what I did. Again, you know, he talked about how he imprisoned and beat <coughs> uh, in every synagogue them that believed on, on thee, on Jesus. And then he also talked about being a participant in, uh, in the murder of Stephen, you know, having their cloaks, you know, at his feet, taking care of the, clo of the coats of the, the men that, that stoned Stephen. And so, so yeah, he was, he was there as well. And because of that, uh, Paul wasn't going to be a very effective witness in Jerusalem, was he? You know, because of his reputation, even though he was cha chained. Uh, we know uh, uh, Barnabas, you know, brought him into the council, and it was only because of Barnabas and his reputation that, that Paul was even received into the church, you know, and his testimony uh, so, and Jesus tells him this as well, you're going to have to leave because, because of the things that, that you've done. And there's a reason also, because I have something else for you, Paul. I'm going to send you far hence unto the Gentiles. And, of course, when the crowd hears the word Gentiles, uh, you know, up to this point the crowd was listening to Paul, and now uh, this word was the wrong word according to, to their way of thinking, and uh, and and so they, it gets the crowd, you know, stirred up away with this fellow. He's not fit to live. In other words, let's 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 kill him. You know, we're back to, the to the same thought process it was before. Any comments here? Feeling awful quiet this morning. I just asked for a testimony. I, a volunteer. I didn't really. <laughs> I really didn't mean you had to. I just, you know, if you if you wanted to share your testimony like Paul's doing here. So uh, last part of the lesson is they cried out. This crowd, boy, they were angry, weren't they? They cast off their clothes. They threw dust up into the air. Has anybody ever been mad enough to throw you coat down and, and grab a handful of dirt and throw it up in the air? Don't raise your hand, but have you ever been that mad? <laughs> I, I've heard of a guy that uh, got so mad at his... Uh, and his tiller wouldn't get started. And he got so mad at it, he took a hammer and just beat the fire out <laughs> Oh, man. Uh, the, 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 the chief captain commanded him to be brought into the castle and bade that he should be examined by scourging, that he might know wherefore they cried so against him. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said to the centurion that stood by, Is it lawful? For you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? And when the centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain, saying, Take heed what thou doest, for this man is a Roman. He has rights. Then the chief captain came and said to him, Tell me, art thou a Roman? He said, Yes. Paul said, Yes. And the chief captain answered, With a great sum obtained I this freedom. And Paul said, But I was freeborn. Uh, then straightway they departed from him which should have examined him and the chief captain also. Uh, so, so again, the, the, the chief captain's trying to figure out what Paul did. You know, why is this crowd so angry? Why is this crowd so disturbed, wanting to kill Paul? And so he instructs his soldiers to tie Paul down. He's going to scourge him. Uh, Paul has been through that before, we know. Uh, and, but this time, you know, he asks the man that's tying him down, you know, is it lawful for you to do this to a Roman citizen? The Roman citizen had, you know, since Rome ruled the world, Roman citizens had rights. There's two ways you could be a, become a Roman citizen. You could be born a Roman citizen like Paul was, or you could purchase your freedom if you was not a Roman uh, with a large sum of money, which this chief captain had done at great expense. And, um, and so, so again, you see God's, hand of 
call it a hand of protection, but a hand of guidance on Paul because, you know, Paul's, Paul's finish line was going to be Rome, you know, and he knew that. Uh, and, you know, there was times in Jerusalem where it looked like this is where Paul was going to wind up because they was going to kill him, uh, you know. And, and, of course, we know, and we'll get into the nec our next lessons where, you know, uh, people – you know, as a group of men said, we're not going to eat till we kill Paul, you know. So I don't know if they starved to death or what. But, uh, but there, you know, there was just a mindset there. But God had other plans. And because God had other plans, you know, that's, that's where Paul went. And so we all have, you know, <coughs> God has plans for all of our lives. And, uh, and we need to, uh, to, to be to the point where we trust in those plans and be obedient to God. And have that mindset, <coughs> you know, what Paul had. To what would what would you have me to do, Lord? What would you have me to do? What what is your plan for me today? Uh, what is your plan for me tomorrow? And and be obedient to those plans. And remember your testimony. Share it with someone, and it'll make. Uh, It'll make a, a lot of difference, I think, in people's lives. I know it will. Any comments here? You don't have to testify. <laughs> we appreciate your attention this morning. Looks like you got a couple minutes there to, because uh, I had allowed time for people to share their testimony. So anyway, you've got a couple minutes to fellowship.
Hey, I want to welcome everybody this morning and got another good crowd. Appreciate all that came out to worship the Lord this morning. I want to extend a special welcome to our visitors. I'm glad to have each and every one of them and just appreciate you coming to Bernard this morning. We love visitors and so we just we just want to thank you again for all you coming. Uh, still got a few things going on this uh, we'll have a vacation Bible school every Wednesday, so if you got kids and, and you grow, of course, got grown up too, but uh, uh, they got a really good program out on the children's Bible school, and we want, just want to welcome you to it too. Uh, choir practice, 5.30 this evening, if you, want, uh, if you want to come out and practice in the choir, uh, I guess that's all. All on that, uh, Brother Danny, you got some announcements? All right, good morning. Uh, Brother Joe touched on it just a little bit on our Bible school, but I was going to talk a little more about that. Um, in, anybody that was here last year for our Bible school, you know, the last night, we call it our blowout. Um, we'll meet in here. We have a have like a drama or something, some kind of little program, and we have all of our giveaways. Um, these kids, as they come in, they get a stamp for being here, then they get an extra stamp if they bring a, a friend. Um, these stamps counts as entries into the drawings, and then uh, at the blowout, we have drawings with prizes. Now, for the prizes, we give away a lot of stuff like um, gift cards, I know a lot of them this year I've talked to, like what, just kind of asking around, what, what would you think would be good for prizes? They've mentioned stuff like basketballs and, and volleyballs and stuff like that. So I just thought if anybody might be interested in donating any prizes, um, whether it be gift cards, balls. I know last year we, we had some people that even donated the large prizes. Uh, we always, for each age group, we'll give out a large prize. Like for the smaller kids, we give bicycles. And for the, the older kids, we find something. You know, these teenagers are not going to be interested in bicycles, so we find something that they're interested in at the time. But anybody that would be interested in donating any of that stuff, you can get with me, um, or you can just bring, bring in gift cards throughout the month and just give them to me for prizes. Uh, if you're interested in one of the big prizes, let me know, and uh, I'll pick it up and then get the receipt to show you how much it was, and we'll go from there. Now, as for our offering, we have the two donation boxes out there that we've talked about, and I know there's been a little bit of confusion about those, so I'm going to put it simple. First of all, we're, we are, we're donating this to part, half of it will go to the orphanage that we uh, sent half of it to last year, and this is a picture. We, we sent enough last year to get enough food for them for a month, and the other half we did something else. This year it's going to stay local for Kids for Christ. Um, I don't know, last Sunday night when we counted what we had, uh, we actually had a tie, so... I gave somebody a dollar to let them choose who they wanted to put it in just to break the tie. But we had a total of $17. And I think these, we're not going to feed much for $17. So let, let, let's start trying to put in our votes and what these votes are. Now, you're not, this is not like a presidential race. You're not voting for your favorite person. Uh, I have came up with something, and for, it's not anything like a, a hot pepper and it's not Jack's gravy that's the two things we'll say that it's not but it's something that is a delicacy in Mexico and we've been talking about different countries so that's what we've we've picked something for there and one of these two brother Jack or brother Philip is going to eat this whatever it may be and you are voting which one of these two that you want to eat this so if you ha if one of these two is your favorite, you vote for the other one. <laughs> I like them both, so I might just 
I might just do like I did last time and give it to somebody and say, here, vote for somebody. But that's, that's where this is going with. You, you don't vote for who you think would be the ve best candidate for office. You vote for who you want to eat this delicacy. <laughs> All right, thank you. And I think Jeff has a little to add to that. Yeah, I, I do, because he, he kind of picked my interest last week when he talked about delicacies, and I thought, well, yeah, I kind of thought, well, they're going to get something real hot, you know, for these guys to eat, you know, set their mouth on fire, and then they drink some milk, you know, and everything will be okay. But no, something a little bit different. So I've done a little research on Mexican delicacies, so just kind of stimulate the offering, I think, here, right? So what could that Mexican delicacy be? You know, it could be a lot of things. So I've picked, I, I've researched here, and there's something called chinquelas, which is red cal caterpillars in tortillas. <laughs> How's that sound? Anybody want to give some money on that? Uh, or it could be escamales. I'm probably butchering the, the pronunciation here. But anyway, escamales is uh, ant larvae. Right, or it could be chalupines, which would be grasshoppers. Now, hopefully, these would be cooked, so it would make it better, I guess. Right? That'd be better, wouldn't it, Jack? If it's cooked. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Or it could be uh, hudaloche, which is uh, uh, corn smut quesadillas, which I guess is like a fungus. I guess. So, <laughs> anybody want to give any money now? Or it could be an assortment of tacos, tacos ojage, which is uh, cow tongue, uh, taco de uh, la quaya, which is cow lips. So apparently they use all the animal, right? <laughs> or dessert, taco laque, which is cow eyeballs. <laughs> uh, it could be... Manudo, yes, I know, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> Manudo, which is uh, cow stomach soup. Uh, Chicatanas, which could be uh, flying ant salsa. So that's some of the things it could be. I don't know what it's going to be because it's a top secret. He won't, I, he won't, Danny won't tell us what it is. But exactly. <laughs> If it's not for the jobs, it's not for the money, it's for the food, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's for McDonald's, yeah. So anyway, uh, I, hopefully that'll uh, get more than $17 back there in them buckets. I mean, and other thing that Nathan mentioned, too, what might be hindering the offering is those pictures back there. On, maybe we ought to change the picture, just put their name on it or something, maybe. That might help, too. I don't know. Okay. That's it. Do you have anything else, Joe? It's time to worship, okay? All right. Let's everybody stand if you would and let's help us sing. He knows how. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus is so wonderful, I love him more and more. Day by day I'm praising him and I his name adore. Light of peace of happiness is shining on my brow. Jesus keeps me happy for he knows how. He knows how. Yes, he knows how. Heavenly joy I'm having here and now. All the way to glory, I should tell my story. Jesus keeps me happy for he knows how trials are besetting me but never i repine grace to overcome them all from day to day is mine just the blessings that i need he always will allow jesus keeps me happy for he knows how he knows how yes he knows how heavenly joys i'm having here and now all the way to glory i shall tell my story jesus keeps me happy for he knows how all the world 
world looks brighter every day as on I go. More and more I love my Lord, it's better Him I know. Yonder I shall praise Him with a sweeter voice than now. Jesus keeps me happy for He knows how. He knows how. Yes, He knows how. Heavenly joy I'm having here and now. All the way to glory I shall tell my story. Jesus keeps me happy for He knows how. Help us sing a song, The Meeting in the Air. <clears throat> you have heard of little Moses in the bulrush. You have heard of fearless David and his sling. You have heard the story told of dreaming Joseph. And of Joan and the whale you often see. There are many, many others through the Bible. I should like to meet them all, I do declare. By and by the Lord will surely let us meet them at that meeting in the air. There is going to be a meeting in the air In the sweet, sweet by and by I am going to meet you Meet you over there in that home beyond the sky Such singing you will hear Never heard by mortal ear Will be glorious, I do declare meeting in the air. Many things will there be missing in that meeting, for the mourner's bench will have no place at all. There will never be a sermon preached to sinners, for the sinner had refused to heed the call. There will be no mourning over wayward loved ones. There will be no lonely nights of pleading prayer. All our banners and our anguish will be lifted at that meeting in the air. There is going to be a meeting in the air in the sweet, sweet by and by. I am going to meet you meet you over there in that home beyond the sky such singing you will hear never heard by mortal ear twill be glorious i do declare and god's own son will be the leading one at that meeting in the air there the doubters will be missing all together. All the skeptics will be absent on that day. There will be no grumblers present to disturb us, and the Aikens will be busy far away. There the saints will have his seal upon their foreheads, dressed in raiment none but ransom ones can wear. All who have the wedding garments will be present at that meeting in the air. There is going to be a meeting in the air in the sweet, sweet by and by. I am going to meet you, meet you over there in that home beyond the sky. Such singing you will hear, never heard by mortal ear, twill be glorious, I do declare. For God's own Son will be the leading one at that meeting in the air. There is going to be a meeting in the air, in the sweet, sweet by and by. 
am going to meet you, meet you over there in that home beyond the sky. Such singing you will hear, never heard by mortal ear, will be glorious, I do declare. And God's own Son will be the leading one at that meeting in the After that list that Jeff gave, uh, Brother Jack's grave sounds a whole lot better, don't it? <laughs> Shoo, I'd hate to try to eat any of them. I uh, do want to wish a couple of people a happy birthday coming this week. Sister Christy and Sister Maya both having birthdays this week. and want to congratulate them. Sister Carolyn, well, happy birthday, Carolyn. I want to wish you a happy birthday. Okay, we're going to take a prayer request and do a, ask you remember uh, Brother uh, Daniel Woods. Uh, he's he's got uh, he's got cancer and it, it where it's sad. It's hard for him to say it's reading. He ain't been able to come to church for a while. Of course, he, he's got a beautiful bunch of girls and thank the world of them and. Some of the men's going to meet here at 5 o'clock this afternoon and go pray at 5.30, excuse me, 5.30 this afternoon and going to run over and pray with him. And, uh, and if you want to come, we'll just be here at 5.30. Also, I got three grandbabies that's pretty sick this morning, and uh, that's the reason Sandy's not here. She had we just run enough arms to hold three of them, so she went down there to help them with them. And just uh, I asked you to marry them up and... Sister Lena Lockard's going to church. Remember her daughter? She got ear infection. Is in a lot of severe pains, and just wanted to lift her up. And also, the Wayne Beard passed away, and we want to hold that family up. Just remember them. Any others? Okay, remember her. Okay. Yes, yeah, remember, yes, continue to hold them up. Of course, Sue and Jackie, they're still having, Sue's having a really rough time, and just continue to remember Sue, Jack. Yes, okay, let's remember these three. Be praying for these. Okay. Any others this morning? Okay. Okay. Be praying for Joyce and Sister Woodridge. Okay. Okay. Remember Sarah. She's she's heard her risk and she went to church. Remember her. Remember, yes, remember him, okay. Others? Yes, remember him, be praying for him. Okay. Yes, 
Yes, okay. Yo's phone. Yeah, congratulations. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah. Sure, maybe she can line them boys out when she gets a little bigger. <laughs> we already will do them. Congratulate them. Okay, let's all stand and just take his knees and believe him this morning. Lord's going to do a great work. Lord, we come to you this morning and I'm thankful once again, Lord, be in your house, be in your presence. Lord, to know that we worship a God of love, a God of healing, Lord, that took us strife, Lord, that we may be healed. And Lord, that it's met sickness, it's hurting. But Lord, we know that our Redeemer lives this morning. And Lord, we just pray, Lord, for the baby, Lord, that you touch him with healing. Lord, pray for Brother Daniel Wood this morning. Lord, that you just happy him through this cancer, Lord. Take it away, we pray. Pray for choice, Lord, in what we call her Disney. Pray for her, pray for Sister Wooler to be with her. Lord, we pray for Jackie. Lord, pray for Sue and Betty and Jack's other sisters. We pray a healing for them. Pray, Lord, continue to hold trees up in prayer. And her sister Rose and the family. Lord, be with them. Lord, pray for the Wayne Beard family. That you just comfort them. Lord, we are comforted only you can be healed. We pray. Lord, we pray for the battle your family also. Lord, be terrible to lose a loved one. Lord, we pray for comfort right the family. And Lord, each and every request given in, pray for Lisa, Lord, you touch her ears with healing. And Lord, just make it better. Lord, we all these requests. Pray for that one husband. And then, Lord, each one we pray and believe in that you're going to work a word. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We can never glorify you enough. But, Lord, we just glorify you this morning. In Jesus' holy name, thank you, Lord and Savior, for all you do for us. Many blessings. Take up the tide and all. Brother Daniel, would you come and pray the blessing over the offering this morning? Let's pray this morning. Father God, we just thank you first and foremost for your mercy and your grace, God. We thank you, Lord, that your power and presence is alive and real. And we thank you, God, that you can make a way where there seems to be no way, God, and that you are fighting the battle for us. I ask, God, that you touch this offering this morning. I ask, God, that you bless it for the furtherance of your kingdom. Bless every family represented here today, and may they have a blessed week. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank y'all for your giving this morning. We appreciate it. each one that gave. I'm going to start our special singing. Go ask Sister Diane to come sing for us.
Sometimes when I'm weary, Satan wars with my soul to get my mind off of the cross. Then I start fighting battles Christ has already won. In a war, Satan's already lost. Oh, but if I'll hold fast to the foot of the cross, I'll be caught in its life, cleansing flood. And if I stay on Can you picture Calvary and that one spotless lamb that suffered and died for my sins? His blood ran so deep that it covered my soul. And Satan, you cannot enter in. Oh, if I hold fast to the foot of the cross, I'll be caught in its light, cleansing blood. And if I stay
Praise the Lord. Lift up your hands all across this sanctuary. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. He is worthy of it all. Amen. Praise God. I feel his presence in this house. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Thankful for what I feel in this place. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Have your Bibles this morning. Stand with me for the reading of the Word of God. Let's go to the book of 1 Kings, chapter 17. Starting to read with verse number 1. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. 1 Kings chapter 17, begin to read with verse number 1, very familiar passage of scripture. Praise the Lord, we want to continue to reverence the Spirit of God that's in this house. Amen. Praise the Lord. When you have it, say amen. Praise God. I want to say that it's good to have all of our visitors here with us this morning. You're visiting with us. We welcome you to the Bernard Ridge Church of God. If you don't have a home church, we encourage you to come back and be with us. Amen. First Kings chapter 17, verse number 1. And Elijah the Tishabite, who was an inhabitant of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. The word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is, before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is, before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. For behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering the sticks, and he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thy hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil on a cruise, and behold, I'm gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first. Bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of all fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of all fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. Hallelujah. Let's pray together, if you will. Dear gracious, divine, heavenly Father, Lord, we're so grateful. So thankful, Lord, for your presence, God, that I feel stirring in this house, Lord. I pray, God, for the next few moments, God, as I preach, Lord and deliver your word. I pray, God, that not our will, but the true will shall be done in the remainder of this service. God, I pray if there may be one lost in this house, Lord, that before they leave here, Lord, that they leave here saved and changed, Lord, by your power. God, with a brand new heart. And God, we just pray, God, that you sanctify those holy, baptize someone in the Holy Ghost and with fire. We pray, God, for healings, Lord, in this house, whether it be in the physical or the spiritual realm. We pray, God, that you heal and and touch in this house today. And we give you glory and praise and honor for what you're going to do in the remainder of this service. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Give him praise this morning as you're being seated. Hallelujah. I, I want to preach on a thought this morning. God is not finished yet. God is not finished yet. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, God's not finished yet. 
We notice in our text that God could, could have arranged for a river to provide water for Elijah. But instead, he used a brook. God could have used a king with a storehouse of plenty to feed Elijah. But instead, he used a widow woman whose barrel of meal was almost empty. For I have found that the Lord is one that can use and make arrangements with any phase of creation. We find this in the, word, in the reading of the Word of God throughout scriptures of how that, for instance, he gave manna from heaven. He took honey from a carcass. He sent fire from heaven and spoke words through the mouth of a donkey. He used a rooster to bring about a message of conviction. So we find in the reading of the Word of God throughout the scriptures of how that the Lord can use and make arrangements with any phase of creation. God's arrangements may seem foolish to the world. As the scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 27, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Hallelujah. Once again we find of how that God can take the smallest and the smallest of things that, that people that the world thinks that may be foolish that God can take these things to confound the wise. That he can take the weak things to confound the mighty. I read in the word of God of how that God used once again his creation to make arrangements for his people. God employed hailstones to smite the Canaanites. He used thunder to discomfit, to weaken, and to overthrow the Philistines. He used the stars to war against Sisera. God used hornets to fight against the Amorites. And he used the earth to swallow up rebellious men such as Nahab and Abihu. Our God is a great God. Our God is a mighty God. Our God is is a sovereign God. Hallelujah. Scripture tells us in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. It was not any false gods such as Allah or Muhammad or Buddha. But the scripture clearly tells us in the beginning God, Jehovah God created the heaven and the earth. It cannot be said of any other God except for Jehovah God of him being omniscient of him being omnipresent of him being omnipotent meaning all powerful all knowing all seeing and all hearing God hallelujah I just want to remind you this morning that our God is a great God our God is a mighty God and our God is a sovereign God hallelujah can somebody give him praise in this house Thomas and David said in Psalms 145 and verse 2, he said, Every day will I bless thee. I will praise thy name forever and ever. So in verse number 3 is Psalms 145. Thomas and David said, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable, meaning there is no end of his greatness. There is no limitation unto his greatness. He is greatness is unsearchable. Aren't you thankful to the man of God preached on Wednesday night and we serve a God that changes not. He's the same yesterday, today and forevermore. He is a God of great wonders. He's a God of great might. He's a God of great power. Hallelujah. All power belongs unto him. I said all power belongs unto my heavenly father. There is no no greater power than the, than the power of an almighty God. He has delivering power. He has healing power. He has resurrecting power. It doesn't matter how many days had they been in the grave. If they've been laying in the grave for four days, he still has resurrecting power. For our God is a God of power. Hallelujah. I said our God is a God of great power. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. But we notice 
and we find the arrangements of our God to be perfectly timed. Uh -huh. The Bible tells us Elijah the Tishabite, who was in the inhabitants of Gilead, he said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years. But according to my word, at the word of the Lord came unto Elijah, telling him to get thee hence and to turn thee eastward and hide thyself by the brook Sherith that is before Jordan. And he tells Elijah, He said, You shall drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So here we find Elijah in the midst of a great famine. Here we find him in the midst of a great drought that the word of the Lord come unto him giving him a plan. Giving him, telling him what he needed to do. And the Bible says that he went and did according to the word of the Lord. I bless the God right in the midst of a famine. Hallelujah. Right in the midst of a great drought that Elijah to obey the plan of God. Hallelujah. And he spoke to him when everything was dry. And he spoke to him when there seemed to be no resources to draw from. That God would tell him in words to say, Elijah, I'm not finished with you yet. I'm going to prepare a brook for your supply of water. I'm going to command the ravens and they're going to feed you breakfast and dinner. Hallelujah. They're going to feed you twice a day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you to know this morning you may feel like that you're in the midst of a great famine. You may feel like you're on the backside of a desert. But I just come to tell somebody this morning that God is not finished with you yet. Hallelujah. I said my God is not finished yet. His plan and his purpose, hallelujah, will be fulfilled by the power of an almighty God. Hallelujah. Somebody praise him. In this house. Oh God. Hey, you think about this. In the midst of a great famine. You know what a famine is? Nothing. A great drought. Nothing to draw from. Have you ever been in that place. Where you felt like you had nothing to draw from. Nothing to pull from. But God was telling Elijah, I, I know there's not going to be rain. I know there's not going to be one drop of dew. It's going to fall on the grass in the mornings. But I've got a plan for you because I'm not finished yet. Hallelujah. In the midst of this famine, I'm going to provide you a place of water. And not only a place of water for you to drink from, but I'm going to hide you. I'm going to prepare a hiding place for you. Hallelujah. That's where I reminded the scripture that tells us he, that he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Hallelujah. He's my hiding place. I said he's my dwelling place. He's my abiding place. I, God, I want to dwell. I want to abide in the power, in the secret place of the Most High God. Amen. Somebody praise him. In this house. Oh, I feel him in this place. Oh, God. So he would drink water from a brook. And the ravens. Was that priest before? They're the most dirtiest bird ever existed. A nasty bird. They would feed him breakfast and dinner. That reminds me of the scripture of David. He said, I've been young and now I'm old. But I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Nor his seen a begging for bread. Oh, glory to God. In all my 48 years of my life, God has never failed me. I said, my God has never failed me. In those times, I didn't know what I was going to do. In those times when I didn't understand what I was going to do. In those times when it didn't seem like I had a clear path, a direction. I've always found that he's always been there. I've always found 
and he's been God. I've always found, hallelujah, that God said, I'm not finished. Hallelujah. Every time God would move, every time God would bless, every time God would show up right on time for the God that I serve, he's an on time God. I say, my God is an on time God. Amen. Oh, somebody praise him in this place. Oh, God. So you may be in a dry place. You may feel like you're drying up. But I just want to remind you, God's not finished. You may feel your home is drying up, but God's not finished. You may feel like your marriage is drying up, but God's not finished. You may feel like your ministry is drying up your Sunday school class, whatever ministry God's put you in. You may feel like it's drying up, but God is not finished. Our God, the devil may be bombarding you on every side. The only reason he's bombarding you is because he knows himself that God is not finished. That God has still got a plan. That God has still got a purpose for your life. Amen. Praise God. Oh, God. Now, the Bible says, Scripture tells us after a while. Yeah, go to that verse, brother. Danny. After a while, the, the brook dried up. Because there had been no rain in the land. The brook dried up. The ravens, they stopped flying. But the word of the Lord. But the word of the Lord came unto Elijah again. Oh, I can hear, I can, and this is Richard's inversion. I can hear God say, I'm not finished yet, Elijah. Oh, I know you've been drinking from a brook. I know you've been, you've been getting fed by ravens twice a day. But oh, I know the brook's dried up because there's been no rain in the land. But Elijah, I'm not finished with you yet. I'm not done yet, Elijah. You see, it's times when you come at the end of your road that the devil wants you to think it's over with. There's no hope. There's nothing else going to happen in your life. There's nothing else going to change in your home. There's nothing else going to change in your family. But may I remind you today that the devil is a liar and the father of them. God's word is a word of truth. You can stand upon the word of God. You can stand upon upon the promises of God. His promises are in him. Yes and amen. Meaning they will come to pass. Meaning they will be fulfilled. For God's word is a word of power. Amen. It's a word of life. Oh God. Can you see Elijah? I bless it God. I feel this this morning. Can you see Elijah looking over at that brook? And that brook's dried up. He'd been drinking from it for days. Scripture says, and it came to pass after a while. Meaning he's been there for a few days. He's been there for a while, but the brook's dried up. He looks up and the ravens is not there. His breakfast doesn't come. His dinner's not coming. But all of a sudden, the word of the Lord came unto him again. He hears the voice of God. He receives another word from the Lord that says, I'm not finished yet. I'm not through yet. I'm not done yet. I got some some of you needs to remind yourself in this house to encourage yourself in the Lord and declare my God is not finished yet my God is not done yet my God has got more my God has got greater for my life because my God is not finished yet amen praise God oh God he tells him, I want you to go to a widow woman. 
Oh, Lord. So I preached to you before the widows in the, in the, in the days of old was the poorest of the poorest. And the word of the Lord comes to Elijah. I want you to go to a widow woman. I've got a widow woman there that's going to keep you up. I've got a widow woman that's going to sustain you. So he comes. Scripture tells us he comes to the gate of that city. He finds her preparing their last meal. And Elijah tells her, fear not, go and do his house. Said, but make me a little cake first and bring it unto me. Make for thee and for thy son. Get, get me a drink of water. He wants, all, he wants her to do all of this. But he gives her the word of the Lord. He tells her, the barrel meal shall not waste. Neither shall the cruise all fail until the day that the Lord sent its rain upon the earth. The Bible says she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and he... And her house did eat many days. As the scripture says. At the barrel meal wasted not. Neither did the cruise of oil fail. According to the day that the Lord. Sent its rain upon the earth. God is not finished yet. I said God is not finished yet. My God is not complete yet. My God is not done yet. There is more. I said there is more. There is greater for your life. Amen. Somebody praise him in this house. Oh. So once again, God sustained his prophet through the help of a widow woman to say, I'm not finished yet. And even for her and her son, God was saying, I'm not finished yet. Can you imagine how that she went that day and picked up that? Bible says a handful, a meal. You know what a handful is? A handful. Whatever you can get in your hand, that's it. A handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil. As scripture says in King James Version, and a little oil. In a cruise, meaning not much, just a, a little, not an overflowing supply, just a little oil in a cruise. That's all this widow woman had was just a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. The day that Elijah showed up on her front doorstep, but God was saying to Elijah, I'm not finished yet. And God used the words, his words to his servant to speak to the widow woman and her son to tell them if you will I'm not finished yet there's more coming your way there's greater coming your way for the barrel a meal shall not waste and neither shall the cruise of oil fail it's not going to run out it's not going to end until I say so but for now I'm not finished I'm not through I'm not done I'm still God and I'm a God a power. Amen. Praise God. Oh. God had more, not just for Elijah, but God had more for the widow and her son. I mean, think about this. She did according to to the word of the Lord as it was spoke to Elijah. She obeyed the word of the Lord and she kept going back to that barrel of meal and getting another handful. Take it, put it on the table. Tuesday morning, go back 
Reach in that barrel of meal. Get another handful of meal. Go back Wednesday morning. Go back to that barrel. Reach down inside of that barrel and get another handful of meal. My blessed God, it never ran out. I said it never ran out, but it had just enough of what she needed. For the scripture says that he and she and her house, they did eat for many days. That is my God. I said that my God and God was saying I'm not finished yet you're getting ready to eat your last meal but I'm still God and I'm not finished yet I will provide I will bless and I will move for I'm still God and I got a power amen somebody praise him in this house give me just a little help up here right there losing my voice God had more now, one translation to verse 16 in the barrel meal wasted not neither did the cruiser all fail one translation said the barrel meal did not run out one translation said there was always meal in the barrel just as the Lord promised can you imagine how she felt You know, it's like the breakfast at my second office. I got two offices here. One across the hall. And my other office is on Main Street at Springs Diner. Anywhere from 8 to 8.30 that morning. You know, my brothers, they, they pick on me. And I love them for it. Because I pick on them. But it's sad to see those gravy and biscuits and those taters and that sauces and biscuit disappear. And sit that empty plate on the table and then come get my plate. <clears throat> you think that would be all you can eat. But it's not that way. Can you imagine how she felt when she was at the gates of that city when Elijah showed up and she's getting the last meal together? What are we doing, Mama? Well, son, I'm fixing our last meal because I've only got a handful of meal in a barrel. And I got just a little oil in a cruise. That's all I've got left, son. Once we eat this meal, if God doesn't help us, we're going to die. Because I ain't got no more food. I ain't got nothing else to cook. I ain't got nothing else to prepare. I ain't got nothing else to fix, son. So this is going to be it. We're going to eat this last meal together. And we're going to die. But after she done the word of the Lord. After she obeyed the word of the Lord. And after she found out to know. Hey, God's got more. For the barrel meal shall not waste. And neither shall the cruise of oil fail. To say God was saying, I'm not finished yet. And every day she would go unto that barrel and keep getting handfuls of meal out of that barrel. That is none other but Jehovah God. That is none other but then the Lord God. Jehovah, the God that will provide. Amen. Somebody praise him in this house. God was saying, I'm not finished yet. Some of you in this house this morning, you need to go back to the barrel and put your hand back in the barrel because God's got more for you. I said, God has got more for you. God has got greater for you. I God, go back to the barrel. Put your hand in that barrel and you'll find that God is there. You'll find that God has got greater. You'll find that God has got more for your life. Return to the barrel. And God was saying, I'm not finished with you yet. Amen. Somebody give him praise in this house. Oh, God. Now, we remember in Exodus, 
And the Israelites were ready to stone Moses because of the thirst for water. The Bible says Moses cried unto the Lord. He said, what should I do to these people that they be almost ready to stone me? In other words, Lord, what are you going to do for me now? What's the plan now? And the Lord said, go on before the people. Take with thee the elders of Israel and your rod. Wherewith thou smote the river, take in your hand and go. And behold, I will stand before thee there upon a rock in horror. And you shall smite the rock. And there shall come water out of it. That the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. God was saying, I'm not finished, Moses. I'm not finished. It may look like you're at a den in road. But I'm not finished. It may look like I'm done. But I'm not finished. It may look like it's over. But I'm not finished. When you get there, Moses, I will already be there. Hallelujah. When you get to that rock in Horeb, I will already be there. Moses, just obey my word. Because I'm not through. I'm not finished. I'm not done. I'm still caught. And I will move for your life. I will bless. And will move for you once again. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Oh, God. He was saying, I'm not finished. You take that rod and you smite that rock, and there's going to come water out of it. Can you imagine? What Moses thought when he saw that water come out of that rock, he thought, I can't help but to think, he thought within himself, God's not finished yet. God's not through yet. God's not done yet. Or some of you had a dead end road this morning. Some of you, it's just on the verge of giving up. Some of you in this house is on the verge of waving the white flag of defeat. But as your pastor, I just want to remind you and tell you this morning that God says, I'm not finished with you yet. I'm not done. I've got more. I've got more. He's a God of more. He's El Shaddai. That God that is more than enough. I said to God, that is more than enough. Amen. Oh, God. Oh. I can't help but think when Moses saw that water come out of that rock. God's not finished yet. I tell out of my side. I like what the psalmist of David said. Psalms 139, verse 6. He says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Meaning it's beyond my understanding. My mind just simply cannot attain it. My mind just cannot comprehend the greatness and the power of my God. Such knowledge of him. I just cannot apprehend. I can't say it enough. I can't put it in enough words of how great and how powerful that our God is. I can not Relate to what David is talking about. Brother Roger, I cannot attain the greatness. I simply cannot comprehend the power and the greatness of our Heavenly Father. Oh, because His greatness and His power is beyond the comprehension of man. Psalmist and David said, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Whither shall I flee from thy presence? He said, if I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there, he said, there thy hand shall lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. Even there in my lowest of places, God is there. Even, in the, even there in the cancer place, God is there. 
there. Even there in the diabetes place, God is there. Even there in the place that I cannot understand, God he is there because God is there because he's not finished. He's not done. He's not through in my life. Amen. Somebody give him praise in this house. Oh, it's not finished. I said it's not finished. God, it's not finished yet. Mm. Things happen when God makes the arrangements. Raven starts flying over your head and dropping food when God makes arrangements. Water comes out of a rock when God when God makes arrangements Red Sea split right down the middle on both sides when God makes the arrangements how God you can read from Genesis and the revelation and you'll find to where God made arrangements for his people that said I'm not finished I'm not through I'm not done I'm still God and I've got more I've got more and I've got greater for your life because I'm not finished. Oh. What happens when God makes the arrangements? Lepers are cleansed. Sigh is given. Issues are healed. Believers are empowered. The dead is raised. The Lord has made arrangements for you and I. He's made arrangements for today and tomorrow. He's made arrangements for time and eternity. He's made arrangements for life and death. Our God has already made arrangements. Just for our lives. God's not finished. Can you imagine how the widow woman, the widow of Nain, on her way out of the city, they're taking her boy to the graveyard. And the Lord comes to the funeral himself and just puts his hand on that coffin. He didn't touch his body. Just put his hand on the briar, the Bible says, meaning the coffin, and spoke to that dead boy. Young man, I say unto thee, arise. And he that was dead set up and began to speak. Hallelujah. What are you saying, Pastor God? It's not finished yet. I said, God, it's not finished yet. Widow Nain thought it was over. But the Lord said, I'm not finished yet. The widow Nain thought, I'm going to bury my boy today. He's my only source of provision. But the Lord said, I'm not finished yet. I've got more. I've got more. I've got more. And I got greater just for your life. Amen. Somebody praise him in this place. Oh, can it be an He's not finished. I said he's not finished. He's got more. I said there's more. I want you to say God's not finished. God's not finished. God's not finished. I bless the God when the enemy comes in like a flood. The Bible says the Spirit of the Lord shall raise up a standard against him because the Lord said, I've got more for them. That's my child. I've got more. I've got greater just for their life. I'm not finished. I'm not finished. Won't you stand with me all over the house? Oh, Spirit of God. I'm not finished. got more Elijah ended up with more than what he had at the brook he ended up with more than what he received from the ravens I feel the Holy Ghost in this place I said, I feel the Holy Ghost in this house. Anybody else feel the Lord in this place? 
Oh, God. He went from being fed, drinking from a brook, being fed by ravens to sitting at a dinner table where the barrel meal kept on supplying and the crews of all kept on supplying. God was saying, I'm not finished. Then her boy would get sick and Elijah would lay upon that boy. Oh, glory to God. He would lay himself, Brother Daniel, upon her boy. Life gone from her son. But Elijah went in, laid himself on that boy. He took him, prayed unto the Lord, and the Lord restored life unto him. God was said, I'm not finished. I'm not finished. I've got more. I'm not done. It's not over. I'm going to show you my glory. Oh. Picked that boy up out of his bedroom and took him right back to the arms of his mother to say, God was saying, I'm not finished. I'm not finished yet, Elijah. I'm going to use you to confront the prophets of Baal. I'm going to use you to pray down far from heaven so that the people will know God so that they will know that I am the Lord, that I am God. You tell them that the God answers by far, let him be God. God was this is telling a lot. I'm getting you ready. I'm positioning you because I'm not finished with you yet. I just prayed down far from heaven. Then he gets on a run from Jezebel. You hang with me. Gets a running from Jezebel. Gets under a juniper tree. Hides in a cave. And the Lord answers him two different occasions. What are you doing here? What are you doing here, Elijah? Because I'm not finished. What are you doing here, Elijah? Because I'm not done. What are you doing here, Elijah? Because I'm not through with you, Elijah. I've got, a, I've got a, another young man that's going to be in a field plowing with oxen. His name is Elisha. He's going to pick up with you. You're going to mentor him. And I'm going to rock double miracles through Elisha. I'm not finished yet. I'm not finished. I God, I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. I'm not finished with you yet, Elijah. I've got more. I've got more. And I've got greater for your life. I'm not finished, Elijah. I want you to know this morning God's not finished with you. God's not finished. The devil may say it's over. He may look like you're at the you're standing at a dead end road, but God says I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm not finished with you yet. I've got more. I've got more. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I want every head bowed and every eye closed. Every head bowed.